morning. Welcome back. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're watching this um, video discussion. Good morning to you. I hope you're having a great day. So, again, welcome back. This is Jomar Adams, and, we'll, I, and I thank you for tuning in again with me for another video and another lesson that we will be discussing. And I'm very excited again to share to you what we have in store for today. So, I hope you'll be able to enjoy learning today. So, let's dig into our discussion. So, what we're going to talk about is all about your fluorometry. Yes, this is an inst um, a part of the instrumentation in the clinical chemistry that I am discussing. So, let's go to your fluorometry. So, before we actually have finished discussing about your spectrophotometry, your atomic absorption spectrophotometry so if you haven't watched that please go to the um video i'll also be providing you the link down below but for this morning for for today rather we will be discussing your fluorometry so to give you a wrap up of what we're gonna do and discuss for today we'll be talking about luminescence so i opted to discuss luminescence because um, it is foundational for you to know that before we jump into fluorometry and eventually when we go to your fluorometry we'll be discussing the principle behind it and of course the different components alongside with it and of course after that i'll be sharing to you what is quenching phenomenon all right are you excited so let's dig in so first is luminescence when we talk about luminescence what does it mean so luminescence is based on an energy exchange process that occurs when a certain compound absorbs an electromagnetic radiation. So the moment that particular um, substance or compound absorb that particular electromagnetic radiation, it will now be from being on its ground state, it will now become excited. And as it actually returns to its original level or at, as it returns to its ground state, it will be returning to an energy level lower than or equal to their original level. And at its thus as it undergoes that process, it will actually be emitting a light or it will also be emitting an energy as we pertain now as your luminescence. So when we talk about luminescence, we actually have three types of luminescence which are very important for us to know the first one is actually your fluorescence which is actually the, the main thing that we will be discussing in your fluorometry aside from that we have your phosphorescence and we also have your chemiluminescence so for the first two your your flor fluorescence your fluorescence and your phosphorescence both of them are actually aided by the principle of photoluminescence okay they are um photoluminescent so what do we mean by fluorescence now so again it is a type of photoluminescence whereby the emission is basically an immediate and therefore generally only visible for a short period of time for as long as the light source is light source is continuously on so what do we mean by that is that when a molecule is exposed to a particular light source, a particular wavelength of light, it will undergo, um, um, it will actually be exciting the molecule. And at the same time, you will actually be observing the fluorescence immediately. You'll actually be observing the emission of light in a short period of time. Compared to your phosphorescence, which is also a type of photoluminescence, Although, this is now characterized when materials can actually store, absorb light energy for quite some time and release it later in time. So, compared to your fluorescence and phosphorescence, both of them are, are photoluminescent. It's just that your, your fluorescence, when it absorbs the light, it absorbs the light and immediately in a short period of time, it will also be emitting that light in a short period of time. Unlike your phosphorescence, it can actually store up your light and eventually it can actually gradually or even um, 
slowly release the light that it actually absorbed. Okay? That is for your fluorescence and your phosphorescence. On the other hand, we have your chemiluminescence. A while back, we were talking that when a, a material is a phosphorescent, is a, um, a fluoropore or a phosphor, a um, can undergo phosphorescence, they should be exposed to light first. So they, we need to be, uh, to be having a particular light source that will excite them. Unlike your chemiluminescence, your chemiluminescence is the emission of light created when there is a particular chemical or electrochemical reaction that took place in the reaction medium. So, it does not absorb any electromagnetic energy. The only thing here that for as long as there is the, there is a reaction, be it um, oxidation, reduction, or hydrolysis, or whatsoever chemical, re whatever chemical process that may be, or chemical reaction that is, it will produce your light. Okay, phosphorescence, fluorescence, and chemiluminescence. And our main topic for today is all about your fluorescence and that is your fluorometry. So, what is fluorometry all about? So, fluorometry in your, according to your Henry's, according to MacPherson and Pincus, it is also known as your molecular luminescence spectroscopy. So, if you hear me say molecular luminescence spectroscopy, Spectroscopy or your fluorometry, it's one and the same. Are we clear? It's one and the same. So, what is fluorometry all about? So, fluorometry measures the amount of light emitted by a particular molecule. Okay, your fluorophores, we call them fluorophores. So, um, a material that can fluoresce is called fluorophores. And aside from that, um, it measures again the amount of light emitted by a molecule after excitation by electromagnetic radiation, meaning there is a um, a light source in it. So it is one thousand times more sensitive than your than your spectrophotometry. Okay, comparing now to your spectrophotometry, it actually is more sensitive. But when we are talking about what which one is the most widely used, it's your spectrophotometry. Aside from that, it is very specific. It's more specific than your spectrophotometry. Take for example, you have two compounds in a solution. Both of them can actually absorb the same light. Take for example, you're, we are in 340 nanometer. So that is an ultraviolet light. So two compounds, take for example, you have compound A, you have compound B. You have compound A and compound B. Both are absorbing the UV light, 340 nanometer. But you can actually discriminate one from the other when they start to fluoresce because they will be fluorescing in terms of the light that they will be fluorescing, it will be different. So one would be this one, one would be A, one would be B, and the system can easily discriminate that. You can easily identify which is which. And in a nutshell, in, the, in its most simplest term, Fluorometry is the measurement of the fluorescence. How much does a material or a molecule is fluorescing? So that is about fluorometry. And we and we are talking about fluorometry. This is actually an example. So I took this um, in an article online. So you can actually see how a material fluoresce. Okay, they can actually fluoresce for as long as they are also is exposed to a particular light source so this is a basic setup of your fluorometer your fluorometry or your fluorometer on your left you can actually see this in your henry's so you have your light source here you have your um atten your attenuator here you have your primary filter your secondary filter those are actually monochromators as well and you have here your sample holder you have your photomultiplier tube and your readout device okay let's dig in so on the other side you also have your um on our on your right you also can see the um the fluorometry setup from coming from bishop okay coming from bishop and let's move on Okay, 
So we have seven. Some of these are actually very much familiar to you already because we discussed this in your spectrophotometer and even your atomic absorption spectrophotometry. So we have your light source, we have your attenuator, we have your primary or your excitation monochromator, you have your cuvette, we have your secondary or your emission monochromator, you have your photodetector, and you also have now your readout device. Okay, let's move on we have your light source so your light source it is now a source of light obviously yes but i want to be specific this is a source of light that is short short wave short wavelength but high energy light so the reason why it is a short way a shorter wave but of higher energy because your goal again is to excite the molecule that is your goal and usually we have your light source like your mercury arc lamp or your xenon arc lamp so that is the most common um, light source that we use again thing that i want you to remember here is that the light that we are uh, the light that is being emitted by your light source is a short wave with high energy short wave with high energy because this would be very important when we discuss now your fluorescence eventually so we also have your attenuator so the attenuate our attenuator intensifies the light coming from your light source so it further intensify the light okay? it further intensify your light so it is very important it is very important. So later on, I'll try to differentiate your spectrophotometry, your spectrophotometer from your atomic absorption spect uh, spectrophotometry and your fluorometer. So I'm actually thinking of doing a, a review video regarding those things. And if you are interested with that, just comment it down below so that I would know that you would want that content so I can shoot it immediately. So, we have your light source. Going back, we have your light source. We have your attenuator. On the other hand, this is very important. I am actually discussing it in order as the system goes. But we, we have here your primary. Some, in some textbook, in some, um, in some textbook, you can actually see this as the primary filter. But in Henry's, it actually was called as your excitation monochromator. Okay, your excitation monochromator selects the wavelength that will best be absorbed by the solution that is being measured. So, whether that is UV, whether that is invisible region or in the infrared region, your primary monochromator or your primary filter aims one thing. That is your excitation monochromator. Okay, that is your excitation monochromator. So, after that, the light will now pass through your attenuator going to your primary excitation monochromator and it will now reach your cuvette. Your cuvette or your sample cell holds the solution or the specimen that is being measured. So, usually, similarly to spectrophotometry, our cuvette, our cuvette is actually more of a uh, square shape rather than round. So again, going back to the when the band pass the the length that needs to um, be traveled by your light. But going back to your cuvette, your cuvette contains again your sample cell. So after passing through the primary or your excitation monochromator, it will now reach your sample. Comes after that is your secondary emission or your secondary filter. Or your emission monochromator and i want us to be specific because it is placed on a right angle so unlike most of this instrumentation that we discuss most are actually linear from the light source from the entrance lead monochromator and then your exit slit to your cuvette going to your photo detector and then eventually to your um to your readout device for your spectrophotometer that is just linear you also have your Atomic absorption where you have your um, light source, your beam chopper, and then eventually your um, 
nebulizer, your atomizer, your flame, or your graphite furnace. And then comes after that is your monochromator and then your photodetector. And eventually leading to your readout device. So unlike other instrumentation, your fluorometer in your fluorometry, the secondary filter or the or the emission monochromator is always placed on the right angle of the cuvette to avoid incidence light come from reaching your detector. So what you want to only detect is the flor the the fluorescence of your compound and not the one coming from your light source. So what you do is to place your monochromator on a right angle on a 90 degree angle so eventually the same thing your photo de your photo detector is also placed there so it converts now the light energy to its equivalent electrical energy it detects the fluorescence light in short so your photomultiplier tube is again the most commonly used photo detector again why why photomultiplier tube because it is sensitive and it can actually detect quick burst of light and low intense or low intensity light so that is for your photo detector and of course you also have your readout device that displays your measurement either by an led or a galvanometer or an amperometer so so much about that we go to your quenching phenomenon which is the last part of this discussion what is quenching phenomenon all about so this phenomenon happens when the excited molecule actually interacts with other compounds within the system and what happens is that the molecule loses some of its energy because of be interacting with other components on the reaction system so it's more likely to 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 have a an analogy ganito siya di ba nasa yun na kayo na, pero nung nag-interact ka sa maraming, kunwari, di ba, ikaw at yung jowa mo, akala mo kayo na, nakipag-interact ka sa maraming tao, at dun mo na-realize na unti-unti siyang nawawala sa iyo hanggang tuluyan na ang nawala, dahil inagaw na ng iba na nandun din sa iisang lugar. So, technically, that is quenching phenomenon. When your a molecule loses its energy because other compounds within the system took that energy upon when p interacting with that molecule. So, that is quenching phenomenon. O, di ba? Pati dito, may hugot pa rin tayo. So, so much about that. We were able to discuss fluorometry. And that is very quick. We have your luminescence. We have the different types of luminescence. We have your flor fluorescence, your phosphorescence, and your chemiluminescence. We also have your fluorometry, the basic components from the light source to your attenuator to your primary or your excitation monochromator to your sample cell or your cuvette to your secondary filter or your emission monochromator to your photo detector, specifically your photomultiplier tube and then your readout device. And of course, nakahugot din tayo when discussing your quenching phenomenon. So... I guess that would be all for today. So thank you so much. Again, I'd leave you with a quote from Zig Ziglar. It is your attitude more than your aptitude that will determine your altitude. And at the end of the day, attitude over aptitude. Because that will determine your altitude. Thank you so much for keeping up with me. This has been Jomer Adams. Again, thank you. If you have any questions, you can find me on my YouTube channel. Just comment down below or email. Send me an email. And thank you so much. This has been Jomer Adams. Please do like this video. If you learned something, share this video. And please do not, do not forget to subscribe to my channel to be updated for the latest happening and uploads that I will be making. Thank you so much and have a great day.